Welcome to the Inner Fire Podcast. We are glad y'all are with us today. Uh, we have my good friend, Daryl Mackin, with us today. Daryl, I've known him for over 10 years. He's a founder and executive director of A Soldier's Child, which you will learn more about as we go through the podcast. But he just has a great story of how God rescued him uh, and then ultimately put him into ministry serving uh, the fallen uh, of this country. So we're just going to get into his story and I know you're going to be blessed by it. Daryl, welcome to the Inner Fire Podcast. Thank you, Scott. Good to be here, sir. We appreciate you driving way out here in the country. In the boonies. In the boonies. Uh, and uh, sitting down and having a little chat with us. Yes. So I want to just start your story right from the beginning. Okay. Where were you born? You know, what's your spiritual journey look like? It was there, were you brought up in a spiritual household? And just kind of, kind of tell us your story. All right. Well, um... I'll start by saying I was geographically challenged at birth. I was born in Long Island, New York. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't hold that against you, well, just so you'll know. It's a funny thing. <laughs> I'm not sure that's the truth. But, but anyway, thank you. Um, well, it sounds I, good, whether we do or not. Here's, huh? here's the funny thing. I was raised in a town called Hicksville, Long Island. Okay. And so uh, at one time it was potato farmland. and uh, But it, it, it's not, it's not, it wasn't country. It's... Uh, the suburbs of Manhattan, Brooklyn, Bronx, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, Queens, all, all the, the five boroughs. Mm-hmm. So um, it, was, it was, you know, it was New York. Um, I was raised in a family of 16. So there was eight boys and eight girls in my family. Uh, it kind of was a hodgepodge, yours, mine, ours, and theirs. Mm-hmm. My mom um, had eight children. I was eight months old. Uh, my mom was pregnant with my sister, Kathy. Um, and my real father abandoned my mom, left, just literally packed up and left her. Hmm. Um, so that was when now, I was, was a that, baby. I, I, I know this probably sounds like a stereotypical question. I'm not trying to stereotype it, but was that a Catholic family or was that? So we were raised Catholic. Okay. We definitely were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We were, we did the Catholic thing. My mom literally was pregnant for, um, I think 12 years straight, almost mm-hmm. 12, yeah. 12 to 13 years. She had, she also had two miscarriages. My mom was an amazing woman. She held it all together. I mean, I, when you hear the, the rest of the story, she was just an amazing woman. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, so my real father leaves. He had uh, PTSD from the Korean War. He was in the Navy, PTSD, and uh, he actually had a marriage before my mom that my mom never even knew of. He had four children, mm. my mom never knew. Um, and then after my mom, so he, when he left my mom, he had another family. So he actually had 14 children. And when he died, he died alone. Mm. And um, yeah, I, I, I met him one time in my life. And I was uh, 17, and it was about a month before I joined the Navy. I joined the Navy as well. Right, right. So, and, um, but I knew... Um, as sad as it is, I knew I, I did not want him to be a part of my life mm. because pretty much everyone he touched, he messed up. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that's his story. Mm. Um, and did you have a father figure at all during those growing up years or was it just your mom? Yes, so that's where the other half comes in. Okay. So my mom had eight um, and then she re- remarried my stepfather. Mm-hmm. Um, he had PTSD from World War II and he was Navy. So you'd think that I wouldn't join the Navy, right? Right, right. I did. <laughs> so, which, uh, you know, I just wasn't very smart. I, just, I, was I wasn't like, going to say that, Daryl. So, um, my mom married him when I was uh, four or five years old, and he became my stepfather. Mm-hmm. He brought six children into the marriage. Um, they had one together, and they adopted my, um, my cousin. Tina. So that made 16. And at one time, in a one bathroom house, three bedroom house with a basement, uh, all 16 of us, 18 of us lived in the house. Wow. Yeah, the bathroom was behind the garage. <laughs> the, the boys' bathroom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Behind the garage. Exactly. The second, the second literally, bathroom. Literally. The outdoor bathroom. Yeah. So, um, and he, he had PTSD. His, he was more faithful to my mom. But his uh, vice was alcohol. So he was a pretty bad alcoholic. And uh, he would leave from time to time. And then, um, actually, he, he did leave. 
He left when I was 12. He was supposed to go down to Texas and uh, start up a spa business. And we were going to move down there in three months. That was a deal. I packed, I literally, I wrote a book about this, mm -hmm. about my whole story, how I, my God story of my life and what I do now with a Soldier's Child Foundation and the connection of it all. But um, I remember writing in, in the book that I, I packed my bags. I literally folded all my clothes and I, and I packed a bag because I wanted to go. Right. Remember, this, I'm going to go to Texas. Right, right. So now I'm no longer geographically challenged. I'm going <laughs> to be in the South. You know? I'm going to be farmland. You know? This right, is what I want. Because right. I should have been a farm boy. <laughs> should have been there. Should have been. Been. Well, I've been living in Tennessee now. You've kind of converted. Ah, so you love me or I can start talking a little bit like this. <laughs> you just bought 11 acres. <laughs> Giddy up. All right, sorry, I won't do that again. <laughs> so, um, so he leaves when um, twelve, and then he comes back um, shortly before my seventeenth birthday. So, on my just after my seventeenth birthday, my stepfather comes back from Texas. So you were he left when you were twelve. He he left came when back I was when you were seventeen. So he's so gone five years. Three months turned into five, five years, years, and you never did get to Texas. Correct. That's right. Yeah. Um, I've been to Texas many times now with a Soldier's Child Foundation. Uh -huh. but So he comes back. So within a short period of time, I meet my real father for the first time. And then my stepfather comes back. He comes back as a Jesus follower. Hmm. Yeah. So he apparently finds Jesus in Texas. And um, the pastor talks, tell, convinces him, you have to go repair your marriage. So this whole five years... Um, I think he came back a couple times. I don't really recall all, but he, they didn't divorce. Right. My, my parents. Right. Know? My mother really never trusted him, um, but they didn't divorce. So when he comes back, he's thumping everybody in the household with a Bible. You know, everybody's running from him. Nobody wants anything to do with him. Uh, they won't allow me to drop out of high school and join the Navy. So uh, I jump on a Greyhound bus. And I go to California. I run away from home at 17 years old. Hmm. So I call my parents uh, from, well, they found out where I was. They called me. Um, I, the story is I left a little dummy trail. And my oldest brother, Mark, and my sister went to Chicago. And they're waiting for me to get off the Greyhound bus. And I'm already in Utah. Because mm. <laughs> I knew my brother was going to squeal. So right, I, right. I, I told my brother where. He faked him out. I faked him out. <laughs> but long story short, I came back home. My mom signed the papers. I dropped out of high school. Um, I was a, um, in 10th grade because I was a year behind because I had uh, some, some surgeries when I was a child. Um, so I was one year back. And um, she signed the papers, dropped out of high school, and I joined the Navy. I went in 1979. Uh, Great Lakes. I was in boot camp. My mom got the last laugh. Um, when my mom was dying in 19... Uh, Let's see, when my mom, 2001, uh, she died of diabetes and she had MRSA. Um, she lost a leg mm. and then lost um, some mobility and ability to speak as well. But I remember telling her this story and she was just laughing. I was in boot camp and I called her and I said, uh, Mom, it was about four weeks and I was bombing. I was just doing terrible. <laughs> I couldn't march. I couldn't cadence. Nothing. I was just... I was just bombing everything. Right. And it was so much harder than I thought. And uh, I called and I was like, ah, I just want to come home. I made a bad decision. Well, all she did was just give out this big laugh. <laughs> and then she hung up the phone. Oh, wow. On me. Yeah. And I wound up doing all, all my six, all six years. Um, I, st I got really good at it. You know, I, I, I was better. Uh, but in, then in the end, when I was about, I was going to re-up. This is in the book. I was going to re-up. Mm -hmm. I was going to get E5. I was going to get Hawaii. They were going to give me money. I got in a fight mm. one month before mm. I was supposed to get out. Mm. And I wound up uh, being restricted to the ship, and I was busted down to E3. Oh, wow. E4 to E3. I was supposed to make E5, now, so I got busted down. I spent the last month on the ship, and literally when I got off restriction from the fight that I was in, I, I got out of the Navy. Hmm. Now, what did you do in the Navy? I was a cook in the Navy. Okay. Yeah. And I did it well. I, was, I, I, I wound up going to the Culinary Institute of America. I wound up getting my GD. Mm -hmm. um, 
I got educated. Uh, now you went you went to the culinary school after the Navy, is that right? Or correct. In the Navy. Yeah. So after the Navy, I went back to New York. Yeah. Pussed around in New York for a little while. Did, you know, worked at different restaurants, mostly Italian. And then I, um, let's see, it was 1988. I went to the Culinary Institute of America, prestigious uh, cooking school, after I got my GD. Got out, got my associates from that. And then uh, I went to Nantucket, then I went to Florida, back to Nantucket, and then I ended up in Hawaii. And I was in Hawaii for, so I was in Nantucket. Let me back up a little bit. So um, when I left home at 17, and now I'm, I'm out of college, I'm 28. So here's 11 years past. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in between all those years, um, I had fallen into uh, just uh, kind of self-destructive ways as far as drugs, you know, um, sex. I was pretty much a dog. Um, that's how I viewed it. Uh, I had no hope. Mm -hmm. I remember my sister uh, invited me to be in her wedding party when I was uh, 23, and the wedding was about six months away, and I remember looking at her, telling her yes, and walking away thinking I'll be dead by, by the time her wedding comes around. Mm -hmm. So that's how I lived. I lived, uh, there was a point in my life I thought, you know, I would have AIDS or some other disease that I'm living with. I just, it was, my mind was twisted. Um, now, let's take a little pause right there because you came up in a Catholic home, had yeah. Catholic background. Mm -hmm. I mean, was church, uh, was there church when you were growing up or did you have any understanding of who God was? Yes. And then, yes. And then during this period of time, these 11 years when you're kind of drifting and making bad decisions. Good what? question. Yeah, so God never let me go. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, good question. So, yes, we would go to Mass on Sundays from time to time, definitely Easter, Christmas, you know, right. that type of thing. Um, there was a time in my, in my family where one of my brothers was sexually abused and my mom reached out to the church and they actually took five of us that were somewhere between uh, 12 and 15 years of age. So my sisters and brothers that were similar mm -hmm. to in my age. And we spent the weekend there, maybe three nights. I remember one particular night, the deacon took us into the church and they had a life-sized cross and one light down on it, and he started talking about Jesus and what did he really do, you know? Because in the Catholic Church, you got all the murals and the uh, stained glass, and you kind of look at it and you kind of see the story, but I really never knew it. I, I, was, uh, I went to catechism, I was confirmed, I, I did all that mm -hmm. in the Catholic mm -hmm. Church, but I didn't really know Jesus at all. Right. But that night, I, he introduced me to him, and he explained to us why Jesus had to go to the cross. He, he talked about the issue that separated mm -hmm. God, our creator, and man, the creation. And it was sin. And so I remember being emotional. I remember crying. And I nailed a nail, a six-inch nail, into that cross saying, I want Jesus in my life. And I remember we all went home. My sister did it. My other brothers did it. I'm thinking right now, I've never talked to them about this night. I've never talked to them, so that's something i got to do from this day forward. It's crazy, but that was a pretty powerful moment. And mm -hmm. It was in my life. I remember it. They right. have to. Yeah. And it was for all the, the young kids that were there because there was a lot of crying. And I, felt the spirit, I felt something over us, mm -hmm. like, a, like, a, like a oil, like a balm you mm -hmm. know, covering us that night. And then get home... And I just remember, you know, it's like, next day you're going back to school, you got to pack, you get, you know, get your stuff together, isn't that? And there was no follow-up. Right. And it right. was kind of like, for the next 11 years, or whatever, how many years it was, you know, just straddle the fence. Mm -hmm. I, I did want God mm -hmm. in my life, but it, I wanted all this other stuff. I right. remember times, during, even during the Navy, raising my hand. I, I will tell you the truth. I'm one of the guys that raised his hand. Mm-hmm. You know, going, someone invites me to church. Right. I raised it probably a dozen times. Mm -hmm. and so my, God, God was working on you. Yeah. You were being sensitive to what God was saying to you, but so. you didn't really have anybody to guide you or mentor you or teach you, and you didn't really get in a, in a good circumstance like that, and so you were still 
you kind of go in your own way well, at the also, same time. Is that, I, is that I, a fair statement? Or yeah, I didn't want to let go of. Okay. My, I didn't want to let go. You wanted God, but you didn't want to let go of all sin. the other stuff you were doing. Sin. Yes. Yeah. Sin. I, 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 what I was going to tell you is, I remember times raising my hand, and I'd have you know half an ounce of marijuana and, and drugs in my pocket and in my sock. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's mm-hmm. how I lived, you know. Mm-hmm. So I didn't want to let go of uh, all of the self satisfaction that sin gives a person. Mm-hmm. I wanted all that still. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> sorry. No, um, so I end up in Hawaii. Okay. I'm living in Nantucket, and literally, like, I'm I'm going to go back to Florida. So I went from Nantucket to Florida, back to Nantucket. So I'm going to go to Florida again. So I'm going to do winters in Florida, summers in Nantucket as a chef. Mm-hmm. Good gig. Mm-hmm. It was pretty cool. Um, one week before I go, uh, there was a lady that I would uh, smoke with, and. Um, she said she's going to Maui, Hawaii. I'm like, I'll go. go. <laughs> Sign me up. And she says, well, there's some conditions. And I'm like, okay, what are they? She's like, well, first, where I'm going, it's all vegan. And I knew she, I would cook for it. I knew she was a friend of mine. I knew she didn't eat meat and everything. So I was like, all right, vegan, okay. She's like, well, where we say you can't eat meat. And that was the biggest problem. The other piece was, it was... Um, it was a nudist colony. Oh my. So it was a vegan. Oh my. That one caught me off guard. Yeah, I'm glad. I, 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 I knew you were headed somewhere. I didn't know that's where you were headed. <laughs> <laughs> a vegan nudist colony in Maui, Hawaii. That's where I ended up. I'm uh, not joking. All this conversation we had before the camera started rolling, it's all. It's all making sense. <laughs> I told you, you, you want it all. I'm going to tell you all. Uh, Full exposure. Uh. <laughs> so, and uh, here's the deal. All right, getting a sunburn, it's true. This is in the book, too. Uh, I went to a restaurant looking for a job, and I got, I got an appetizer. I couldn't sit down. <laughs> Figure out why. I was burning places. You're not supposed to be burning. <laughs> so... And that, that wasn't the problem, though. For me, you know, I had no problem running around naked back then. Um, but it was not eating a burger. I couldn't, I couldn't have meat. They right. caught me. They caught me one time with meat. Uh-huh. And they all got mad. They were very mad. Hmm. And they were, uh, a, they were a bunch of people that were way out there. Mm-hmm. So they believed that drugs could get you to um, the spiritual realm. They believed... Um, well, there was one guy that actually believed that this one spot of the property, which was beautiful, it overlooked a, a drop of about 600 feet right into the ocean. Mm-hmm. Um, he believed that if he waited long enough that he would pick, be picked up by aliens. Um, <laughs> they, I mean, it was the smorgasbord of the spiritual New Age Kalala. Right. It was just like, right. any, anything goes, you know. That's pretty much what it was. Sure. Uh, and hence the nakedness. Right. Except for vegan. Okay. Not anything goes because you can't have a burger. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was there. I got there in um, the end of September of 1991. And it was on Halloween night that uh, we all went into Lahaina. This was the town of Lahaina um, in Maui. I drove with the, the woman that invited me there, uh, her boyfriend, and then another woman. Um, her name is Kitty. And um, when I was at this place, there were certain nights that I'd go to sleep and I felt, um, I felt this spirit, this dark, oppressive spirit that was there mm-hmm, mm-hmm. at the place. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't know where it came from or this or that, but it was there. Right. And there was probably about 30 people living in this commune, which right. is what it was. Right. And um, anyhow, there was a number of times that I remember before this night that I would think about God. I would think about, mm-hmm. I would just think about God. Mm-hmm. Um, when I would feel this oppressiveness as I'm going to bed. It would always happen at night. So anyway, Halloween night, we drive into Lahaina where we all dress up. 
So I was dressed up as an Indian. And uh, so we all go in there and this other sister commune, so join them and it winded up being like 50 people. Uh, and they have like little bongos and um, what do you call it? Um, little shakers. Little rattles. Shakers uh, and everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tambourines. And, uh -huh. uh, and they're all dressed up in kind of fanfare. Mm -hmm. um, like kind of one though, you know. Well, they're in town and they're, they form a circle and they're doing this chant. And people, I mean, there's thousands of people in Lahaina mm -hmm. on Halloween night. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a Mardi Gras. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, they're going to and fro, and people are stopping, checking out this exhibi exhibition. You know? Right, right. And um, my eyes saw, it was crazy. I remember looking, I wasn't in the circle. I was outside, like the people watching. And I saw what they were doing, and I, could, I sensed it, I knew it, I felt it, and they would call them down spirits into these people that were in the middle. It was, it was nuts. I know you're hearing that for the first time, mm -hmm. you're kind of like, mm -hmm. you know. Well, there's a, I mean, there's a spirit world out there, right? Yeah. A lot of people either deny it or they uh, acknowledge that it exists. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's biblical, mm -hmm. and we don't want... it's. We don't want a wrong relationship to the spirit world, right? I mean, no. we, we want we want God in our life. We want the Holy Spirit in yeah. our life. But there is a, another well, he side tells of that fence, right? I mean, I mean, it's clear in Scripture. What did Jesus do? Most yeah. He cast most, out demons. Yeah, most people just don't get in the middle of it and have the kind of experience that you're, Correct. you're talking about. But right. that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So this so. is the whole point of why God chose that place. Hmm. That night would be my night. And what he did was he literally just pulled back the curtain and that I would see the spiritual warfare mm -hmm. that exists and specifically over my own soul. Mm. So the night ended a couple hours later and um, I remember meeting up with everybody in the parking lot and, and Aaron and um, Sue were packed in like sardines into one of these old 1969 uh, Volkswagen mm -hmm. vans. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're, they're, it's just packed of people that are going to go back to right. uh, Akua is the name of it. Um, that was the name of the place, Hale Akua. Um, and it means house of God. It was a missionary hmm. uh, place at one time. Originally, yeah. Originally, that's what it was, yeah. I don't know what it is now. But anyhow, I get to the van and I say, let me in. I want to come in. And they're like, no, 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 no. You just drive back with Kitty. And I'm like, I don't really thought, no, 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 no. I don't want to. I want to go, I want to go with you guys. Because I knew she was part of the source. Mm -hmm. and, um, they were, and Sue said, uh, you know, we'll meet you back there. It's only an, a little over an hour. We'll meet you back there. So... They close the door and they take off. And she's standing behind me. So I got into her uh, Cadillac and uh, we started driving back. And um, um, she started talking to me and I had an anger towards her. And I told her, I was like, look, just, just don't talk. Don't talk to me. All right, I don't want to talk to you. We'll just drive back. And I think it was because I... I sensed, I knew what had happened, what mm -hmm, I saw mm -hmm. came from her. But mm -hmm. she had something to do with it. Right, right. So that's where I, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be near her, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So as we're driving, she's driving, I'm in the passenger seat. The next thing I know is I'm screaming. Hmm. Yeah, it's just, I'm in complete torment in my mind, my whole being. There's something has just come taken, over you come over taking over yeah hmm. and uh, it was the most vile uh, disgusting evil I mean if you think about when Jesus when the Bible describes the torment these people were in mm -hmm. that's what I experienced wow in that brief moment hmm. and um, I felt like I had retreated to like 
just the last little sane thought in my brain that I could think mm -hmm. that did what's happening to me. And um, I said in my mind, God, if this is how you want me to die, then this will be the way I die. And I literally screamed what I thought was my last breath. Mm. And I thought, I'm, I'm, I'm dying right now. Right. And I'm going to just, whatever, combust. That's what it felt like. It was so much death. Mm. It just was death. You know? How do you, how do you think you were going to die? I don't know. I was just going to die. I was going to mm -hmm. just die. Because mm -hmm. death was all over me. <clears throat> and so when I screamed, and then I said what I said in my mind, it was instantaneous. It was the most miraculous thing I ever felt in my life. It will be. I know I will talk to Jesus about it when I see him. Um, but it was the Holy Spirit, instantaneous. That evil spirit was gone, it was out of me, and the Holy Spirit was over me. And I was in the car, and I remember I had my hands clenched like this, and I had my eyes closed, and what I think was about seven minutes long, um, I just had, I was, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's what I did straight for seven minutes as I'm getting this download hmm. of God speaking to me hmm. in my mind and telling me that it was time for me to come out of the dark, that I was, um, that I was playing in the park of dark, that he knew me all my life. That if you say you, you say me. If you say me, you say you. Telling me that that was how connected I am to him. Mm -hmm. um, he talked about um, how he had been with me through the times uh, that I wanted him back, wanted him in my life. Um, that from this day forward, things were going to be different. Um, that I would live for him, um, that I would have power in him over darkness, that I, I now possess the power over darkness in my life. It was, it was crazy. I mean, it's, you know, all of a sudden I get this, you know, mm -hmm. it's like... Right. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty radical difference uh, from the... I don't share it a whole lot. <laughs> well, I just live my life now. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, it sounds like a Damascus Road experience. It was. That's what I do say that. Right. I do say that. Yeah. It was, yeah. I mean, uh, you were in darkness and yes, sir. And miraculously God showed up and really shined a, shined a light into your, into your life. And in my soul. You. Right. So, um, so finally, you know, again, the Spirit of God speaks to me, tells me things of my future, talks about the, His kingdom, talks about heaven and talks about Judgment Day. Um, and then, again, you know, I'm not biblical, so I know nothing of this, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and then the spirit kind of lifts off, and then it's like normal again. Mm -hmm. And the woman, the where this mm -hmm. spirit came out of, was driving. And during the time, that, that seven minutes, I can hear her making sounds like, <gasps> or... Oh, like I could mm -hmm, hear mm -hmm. gasping and just kind of because she was getting it too she mm -hmm. was hearing it I, I can't explain it mm -hmm. but I know you know I never really like asked her you know yeah. I never saw her again really after that night something was happening in her while it was I happening felt, in I you. knew that I knew that so as soon as when the spirit left I looked at her and the first thing I say to her is it's for you too that's the first thing I said <laughs> I, and then I said take it you can have it too. That's what I said. <laughs> I really did. First of all, she leases this dog out on me. Now I'm going to tell you it's for you too. <laughs> it's like, okay, God's already at work. And I'm not kidding. That's exactly what happened. And I could, and she's kind of like, like this. And mm -hmm. she's kind of looking at me a little bit like that. And I could see her thinking, processing. Right. You know, and I looked at her with all, whatever she was wearing, um, I could see her as a child hmm. as without this thing right right and i could see her thinking and i'm not kidding her whole body just jerked right back and she was gone hmm. it's like she went boom and it was back in her 
Hmm. Right back to the state she'd been in before. Yeah, this thing was back in her. She was possessed again. Wow. No question. Because as I go back here, I start thinking about, so she's gone, she's driving, mm -hmm. and we're driving to this place, right. it's 2 o'clock in the morning, and I come back here to myself, and I'm thinking about what just happened to me, mm -hmm. what just happened, my, my life just changed, God just rescued me, I was dying, I just gave my life over, I was dead, mm. I literally took a breath thinking I was crossing over, you've never experienced it, I died. I died. Mm. I honestly died because I let it all go mm -hmm. and I believed I was crossing over. Mm. So now I'm still alive. Right. <laughs> Much to your surprise. <laughs> and it's like, okay, what, what do I do now? Right. What's going on? Exactly. You know? And I'm thinking about just what happened and it's beautiful. I'm thinking beautiful thoughts. I'm thinking, thank you again. You know, just praising it and I don't know anything about it, you know? Mm. And then I feel this thing right here. This is as, far, as close as it could come. I could feel it. And I just pointed and I said, stop. And I felt it just suck right. This is where it gets kind of strange where people are like, okay, he's on drugs. I'm telling you, <laughs> this is, I was allowed, this was allowed to happen to me. I experienced it. It was real. Listen, wake up. <laughs> you know, there's, a, we, we all, those of us that believe, that when you die, it's not the end of life, that we actually go to eternal life, mm -hmm. to the spiritual world. Mm -hmm. Well, it exists here. Right. We're spiritual beings, mm -hmm. you know? Hey, just read the Bible. It talks all about it. Right, it does. And that window was open to me. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. You know, it was rough. Mm -hmm. you, know, it, you know, it's one thing I always have thought about. Those guys that were delivered in the biblical times mm -hmm. doesn't really track anyone's life after that. Right, right. But... It was diff Their lives were different. And, right. and trust me, when you come out of something like that, it just... Um, it, would be, it would be interesting to know some of those that were demon-possessed yeah, in, in the that Bible moment. that Jesus cast well, the demons out. I didn't out. help him. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've done it right. Listen, yeah. here's the deal. You know, Jesus doesn't change. He's the same. He's always there, and he's always enough. Right. The Lord's always enough. And so that's what I've experienced the last 30 years. It's been 30 years now. Just wow. about. Yeah. So how did you get out? I mean, how did you go from... That night? That night, you're, you're, you, I guess you, you made it back to the, to the compound, I'll call it, at some point in time. So, so I got woken up at 6 o'clock in the morning. Okay. So I'm knocking on the door. I, w I winded up staying in the one guy that was a friend to me. And they say, I heard the girl outside said, is Daryl in there? And he said, Yes. And he said, well, he's got a message down by the payphone, the old payphone. Mm -hmm. And I've been there for a month. And one thing that I could always get a job cooking. Mm -hmm. I went to so many restaurants on Maui, I couldn't find a job. So here I am, 30 days into it. I have no money. I'm broke. You know, I have no clothes. I mean, I have nothing. And I can't get a job. I get down to the phone, and um, there's a message to call the Holly Miley. It was the top restaurant on, on Maui. Mm. And that day, I went in for a job interview. When I left that place, I mm -hmm. never went back. Mm. I went into Haile Miley, got the head chef position. Wow. I got a car that day, and I got a cottage to live in that day. That night, I slept in a cottage, and I had a car. And the next day, I started the job there. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> How did that happen? I mean, that's <laughs> come on, <Al>. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. It's part of my story. I love it. Thank you, God. He was like, "Yeah, that's good." So he was the perfect time. He took me out. Mm. You know, he took me so out I of mean, the park. Of the, the, the fact that the I mean, a lot of people would listen to this and say, "Well, it's just coincidence that uh, the message showed up the next day." And whatever. But I mean, I there's, what it there's, was. yeah, there's no coincidences no. with God. No, and that's the thing I've learned in all of this. Even from my birth to now, I'm going to be 60 this year, Scotty. Mm -hmm. God has been involved in everything. He's, mm -hmm. I, it, it, I know he's been involved in everything in my life. And, and the things that I have given over to him, he has used for, for, for kingdom purpose. That I serve Jesus Christ. I'm a part of his, the ones that serve him. I'm a follower of Christ. 
and I, I recognize fully as I have grown, even over the, all these years, and I've, as I've done the ministry of a soldier's job, caring for widows and orphans, you know, mm -hmm. kids that kind of, you know, lost my, both my, my stepfathers, you know, uh, were traumatically affected by war. Mm -hmm. And in turn, it affected me. Mm -hmm. They were some part of my life, not really, but um, now I serve children who've lost a parent. Mm -hmm. you know, so I've become a surrogate father to almost 5,000 children across the country. Mm -hmm. And it's the power of God in me, the love of God in me, that I display mm -hmm. to these children. Right. And I recognized that what transpired was, first, uh, he brought me to a point where um, I found him, he rescued me. And then he put me on, just like the scripture says, put my feet on solid ground. Mm -hmm. And I did. I was. I found the greatest church home in Maui for for almost four years. I was there. Um, I never had you know sex again until my marriage night. I mean, mm -hmm. he delivered me, delivered me, delivered me. I mean, I remember one time witnessing a couple months after I, I, I got saved that night to someone on the phone in New York, and I remember putting my arms out and feeling chains fall off of me. Hmm. Um, times that I would actually take. A shower, I would feel, as the water came over me, I felt the Holy Spirit come over me. Mm. I mean, those were moments he gave me, mm -hmm. you know, to build me up. Mm -hmm. And he did, he built me up. Mm -hmm. I started working with youth at my church. Uh, I started, I quit cooking. Okay, so that was that in, in, in Hawaii still? You quit cooking there? To become a substitute teacher because okay. I knew he was calling me. Okay. Well, I knew I, it, I knew, I, I, knew, I, knew it, it. I knew at some point in time... Uh, you went from being a chef to being yeah. a teacher. Yeah. I wasn't exactly sure where that transition happened. So that was still in Hawaii. And you so I was I was the head chef of the of, of uh, Bev and Joe Gannon. They're the owners still. Mm -hmm. um, I was tracking along the road of, of getting on the Food Network. <clears throat> That's what I wanted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I was cooking with Emeril Lagasse and Dean Faring and all these guys. They would come to Hawaii and they'd do book signings and stuff. And I'd cook their food as the head chef. Um, and it was just great. I mean, it was, I was steaming along in the culinary world. Mm -hmm. And um, there was one woman that worked for me in the pantry part-time. And I remember I just would constantly ask her about her day job. And she was a elementary school teacher. Mm -hmm. And I would just keep asking her, uh, tell me more. Tell me, you know, what is it like? Mm -hmm. da -da -da. Mm -hmm. And I knew what was happening. And I put my one, one month's notice in after working there for about two and a half years. And they, they thought I lost my mind. I became a substitute teacher at Maui High School. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. At 30 years old. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was, that's the beginning of the end right there. Because so uh, when uh, I met Jojo, my wife, mm -hmm. at church, uh, we wound up, we, when I asked her to marry me, we, we went back to Maine. That's uh, just where she was raised. Uh, so I uh, went back to Maine and became a substitute teacher in Maine. I finally got my own classroom, uh, conditional, as long as I got my teaching degree. I went to University of Maine and got my teaching degree. Mm -hmm. It took me about five years. Um, and I, became, I taught culinary arts in uh, high school for almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. So I did about uh, nine years in Maine. And then in '04 we moved to Tennessee. And I worked at Blackman High School for about, uh, I worked to 2013. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. about another nine years. So did you, did you come down here to teach or what? I what? came here to teach in, okay. two, in 04. Okay. Yeah, that was the drive. And, and also JoJo, is, um, she's an author, she's a writer, mm -hmm. um, she's a songwriter. Um, so we came, you know, this is the Yeah, Nashville's where to be, right? This is the hub, yeah. No doubt. For Christian music, contemporary mm -hmm. Christian music. And uh, she did, she wrote an album or two here. Um, but then she got into teaching, so she teaches now at a private Christian school. Um, but it was in 07, um, so we were living on a, uh, on a road in uh, Murfreesboro, and um, across the street were my neighbors, Henry and Faye Golzinski. Mm -hmm. And we, they were very close with our kids. Uh, the twins were born in 05. Zach is, at, and so it's 07. Zach's about ready to turn six. Mm -hmm. um, twins were probably, uh, I guess, they're two years old at this point, and they lost their son 
Marine Staff Sergeant Marcus Kuczynski to uh, sniper fire in Iraq. Excuse me, yeah, Iraq. And it was almost to the day he was supposed to come back from his second one-year tour with the Marines. Mm -hmm. um, he had done one year, got out, and was in the reserves. And when he heard that his unit was going back, he signed back up because he wanted to be the one leading the young men, uh, the young Marines that were going into battle because that, that's what he would have done. Mm -hmm. And he did. Um, he wrote, I remember um, after he died, a um, couple things. One, the, the, the image. Yes. The image of his son. That was, yeah, which became a very famous image yeah. across the U.S. Across the world. Uh, of his son receiving the flag. And, yeah. and we, can, we can show that picture. I'm sure people will recognize it. But, yeah, a very famous picture there. Go ahead. Right. So, just, just like everybody else, you know, that photo captured me. Mm-hmm. And it was some time, probably about three months of time that had passed. Um, and I would go across the street with, to my neighbor, Henry, mm -hmm. and he would tell me more about Mark. I didn't know much about Mark. I never met him. So he would tell me about Mark's story and you know, who he was as a young man and as a man. And, um, uh, one night, uh, I saw Henry come home and I walked across the street and um, it wasn't a good night. And um, he said to me in anger, did it really matter? And does anybody give a damn? Mm -hmm. And then he turned around and walked into his house and left me standing in his garage. Left you to think about the pain. That question. That question. Well, he was angry. And, and, and the pain a, that he had over very valid, losing his son. Yeah. Did it, did it matter? Yeah. Does it matter? That's a very that's, good question. That's the question. Does yeah. it matter when we loot? You know, you hear about it on the news. They, they, you know, it might be top news. For, you know, when the wars were going on, mm -hmm. you know, it was. Right. You know, you'd hear a report of whatever, wherever you were, whatever state, whatever town, county, you would get the news of mm -hmm. who was lost within your community. Right. And it happened all over the country. I mean, it's, it's happened. It's every war that we've gone through. Mm -hmm. But then it'd, be, then it'd be out of sight, out of mind, you know. And when you think about it, realistically, and this is the thought I had when Henry said it to me, because it took me 45 minutes to get home and I lived across the street. Two thoughts. One, I've never thought of Henry, of the families left behind, or the children left behind. Mm -hmm. And I consider myself a Christian patriot. Mm -hmm. And I give to orphanages. I've done, been on missions trips to mm -hmm. orphanages mm -hmm. in different countries. And I've Never even thought of these children who right. are now widows and orphans of our fallen. Mm -hmm. That's what we have in our country. Right. And the truth of the matter is, no one thinks of them. Mm -hmm. They really don't. They got yeah, a title. They, unless, they're in, unless they're in, unless it's your family, right? Yeah. It, people just tend to go on with life. They, like I said, they hear about it on the news, but they don't really connect with it or think about it on a day to day. Well, realistically, you think of all the nonprofits that exist. So. Mm -hmm. Habitat for Humanity. You know who they are? You know mm -hmm. what they do? Yes. I mean, you want to go work at a homeless shelter, you want to work for a cancer <clears throat> cure, run, walk, whatever, mm -hmm. raise money for them. You know, I mean, Salvation Army, uh, Make-A-Wish Foundation. We know all these. Mm -hmm. What is there in our country that actually cares for the children of our fallen? If you want to put your time, talent, treasure towards a nonprofit that cares for children of our fallen, what exists in our country for you to do that? Soldier child. <laughs> but, yeah, but the truth of it is, that's really nothing. Right. Well, mean, it, before... Yeah, yeah before, before 2007, tangible. There, there was nothing. So There are some that exist. Yeah, and but, there's a lot of, like, you know, there's a lot that serve, like, uh, wounded warrior and people like that, but that specifically serve the children. There's, there's not a lot with of the, with the go With the gospel message. Exactly. We're it. Right, exactly. That's it. So how did... So in 2007, I, you know, I know the answer to this, but... You know, God orchestrated the fact that you lived across the street from the Golinski, uh, Golzinski Golzinski family, yep. Yep. right? Um, so, what did that bring about? I mean, God put you there for a reason. What did He put in your heart to do? And what and how did this? We have, you know, we were, we'll talk about a soldier's child and more about what you do as you go along. But yeah. how did it get started? What was put into your heart to do? Just that, to answer that question, mm -hmm. I, 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 so the second, so my first was. I've never thought of him. Mm -hmm. And then my next thought was my own death. 
So I, I'm pretty much probably like most fathers. Mm -hmm. the, especially coming from what I came from. My father left when I was eight months old. And then my stepfather left when I was 12. Mm -hmm. So I have a fear that I would die mm. and leave my children behind. Right. So my twins are 16. <laughs> and my son, is my oldest, is about to turn 21. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm doing well. <laughs> Lord. You're still here. You I'm still here, Lord. A few more years. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> what the heck, dude? I'm saying until they're until they're grown, right? <laughs> Daryl, you know you, you. I gotta just face you out right now. You just get this just I did a few, and not a few more years to die. A few more years to your kids. To I are make grown. it. I know the, when I consider the finish line. You're absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's uh, that's I think that way. Right? Have you thought that way? Uh, yeah. About your death. Oh yeah, I do. And yeah. that you would leave. Your children. Well, my kids, my, my, mine are all grown. Though. They're all grown, but I mean, but when I they mean, were young. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I well, anyway, I did. I, mm -hmm. Constantly, I would think that. Right. So those are two thoughts, and so what I what I left with was, I'm going to answer those two questions. Yes, it does matter, and yes, we do care. I do. Mm -hmm. And then I got I got fired up. Mm -hmm. I had the inner fire. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. It right. really was. Yeah. I felt it, and so and it was a good intention and. Um, but I was going to fulfill it. Mm -hmm. And so one thing, two things happened after that. One was my own son's birthday. Uh, as I was prepping for it, I copped mm -hmm. an attitude about it. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at that photo and I realized, oh my gosh, this boy's never going to get what I have an opportunity to give my son. Mm -hmm. And his father's gone. Mm -hmm. he, he does nothing anymore. Mm -hmm. And I get to do it. And my son gets to get it. So that was definitely a turning point. That's why birthdays. That's why we celebrate the birthdays, the lives of the children right. because right. of that night. Right. So my son's birthday was in November and then come Christmas, I have my brother-in-law and his wife and he brings his kids mm -hmm. over to my house. Mm -hmm. Christmas 2007. Mm -hmm. And I'm in the kitchen and I'm doing my thing. I'm cooking lamb and turkey and stuff and, and just all the trimmings, everything. I'm just doing my deal. And they're blessed because I'm cooking. <laughs> so he comes in the kitchen. He's like, dude, he's like, I got it. He's like, listen, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do DMAC cuisine. We're going to take your Thai chili rub, your blackening spice. We're going to take this, this, you know, stuff that I right, do right. that I'm the kind of known for right. as a chef. And uh, we're calling DMAC cuisine. We're going to bottle it up. We're going to get it on the internet, and you're going to make some money. And I was like, okay, man. I remember taking my apron off, leaning back up against the counter, and then I said it. I said, bro, I said, and my brother-in-law, Theron, he's a believer, mm -hmm. full on, uh, he's now a pastor. So um, I looked at him, I was like, man, you know what I really want to do? He's like, what? I was like, I want to celebrate the birthdays for the children of our fallen. That's what I want to do. Hmm. The first time I said it, wow. on Christmas Day, 2007, hmm. and he's like, okay, bro, we can do that. And sure enough, man, for three years, he got us copyrighted. He got us nonprofit status. I mean, he's smart. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I got purpose-driven passion, right. and he's like the intellect, right. you know. And so he got us a website. He got us solicitation license, and all of it. Mm -hmm. he got it all done. Uh, bylaws and uh, for our board, and helped me form a board. And and then after three years of just cranking along, we're up to like, after three years, I think we were somewhere around 200 kids we were serving mm. in like 12 states. Mm -hmm. He just kind of said, okay, man, it's all yours, I'm out. All yours. And he just kind of faded off. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about your passion for just a minute because, mm. you know, I have known you for over 10 years. Uh, you're Longer than that, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, I mean, going on. From the on, beginning. Shoot, yeah. You've known me from the beginning. Yeah, right from the beginning. It's going on 13 and 14 years 13 and 14, yes, sir. <clears throat> You've always been a passionate person, mm. right? So that passion drives you to do what you do. Uh, how important do you think passion is in us living out whatever God, you know, God's got you in a particular role. He's called you a particular thing, but other people have been called to their particular thing. How yeah. important is it that they have a passion well, for? Well, it's the name of your show. Right. It is. Yeah. It's the inner fire. What is passion? So, Because here's the deal. For me, the way I was raised, I'm not kidding. Someone would ask me, what are your dreams? I'd start telling them about what I dreamt about last night. 
Right. I'm glad you think that's funny. Because <laughs> you never thought that way. You had your, you, you're a guy that grew up with, you sure, had dreams, yes, yes. you had desires you were going to go chase that, right. you were going to do. I had never had any of that. Right. I never even understood the meaning to, of that. Right. I had no drive. Mm -hmm. I really didn't. Mm -hmm. um, I had no purpose, you know. And God put all that in me. Mm -hmm. I found it. I found my purpose, my passion in Christ. In Christ. Mm -hmm. And it just so happens that he uses my story. Something that he knows that I'm going to, that it's going to light my fire. Mm -hmm. My inner fire. And it right. did. It's exactly right. what it did. Right. I'm all about the widow. I'm all about that kid that doesn't have a father. Mm -hmm. I know what it feels like. Mm -hmm. I do. I know what abandonment feels mm -hmm. like. You know, I don't wallow in it. I, I absolutely know. You've never heard me talk about it before mm -hmm. today. Right. I do not wallow in it. Right. I move forward in it. Right, but it drives it, it drives you, and I think your whole story, I think, to me, points to the fact that, you know, God calls different people to different things. He leads us through life down different paths, yeah. but He equips us along the way Definitely. for whatever it is He's got for 20 us. Twenty years to of do. training. I was a teacher for twenty years. Yeah. <laughs> I was tr I was all training. Right. Because I, I when, when this remember I told you in the beginning, He gave me stuff. Well, one right. I read the book from Robert Cunningham, YWAM guy. Mm -hmm. And Rob Cunningham saw a vision. God gave him a vision on a wall of young people crashing onto the shores of countries. That was the vision. Look it up. Mm -hmm. And so I read his book, and it's about three nights, three months after 19, Halloween 1991, after mm -hmm. that night I got saved. Mm -hmm. I rescued. I mean, I was reading the word. I remember this particular day, I was in the Bible. All day long, reading from front to cover. I was just reading, 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 reading. I read some of the, the, the book. And I'm laying in my bed, and I heard, I heard, I will give you a vision. Mm -hmm. I heard it. It was mm -hmm. audible. And I, what did I do? I went right to the wall. Look at the wall. I'm looking at the wall. <laughs> I'm like, oh, bring it, bring it. Uh -huh. And nothing, you know. <laughs> and so literally... From that day, from uh, so that would have been um, 1992 mm -hmm. to 2007, so that's uh, 16 years, 15, years, 15 yeah. 16 years. Mm -hmm. I started, well, 17 years because I started a soldier's child in 2008. Mm -hmm. With one right. child. We right. celebrated Christian Golzinski's 10th birthday mm -hmm. at his father's bus ceremony in Lewisburg, Tennessee, uh, June 2nd, uh, 2008. Mm -hmm. That was the first birthday, the first life that we celebrated was that right. boy in the photo. Mm -hmm. 18 years after I heard God say, I will give you a vision. Mm -hmm. I thought I lost it. I thought I missed it. Right. And so I thought it was actually just, I'm, I'm going to... Fade off into the sunset, just keep teaching. So what is that? I mean, what do you think? I mean, that, that in itself is a message for people. Correct. Right? Yes, sir. Uh, stay is the it course. patience? Stay the is course. Stay the course. I mean, stay when, the course. When God puts something in your mind, stay with it. Hang on to yeah. it. Don't give up on it right. because he's not giving up on you. It's, I believe that all of us go through training. Mm -hmm. As a believer, if you can't say that you've been trained, that, you've been, that you're being equipped... That's an issue mm -hmm. because you are going to, all of us, if we're supposed to Christ followers and we're, we work for the king, mm -hmm. we're getting trained. Who's training us? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, here's the deal. The Holy Spirit taught me how to be a man. I didn't have a, I didn't have a father. Mm -hmm. I didn't have someone to teach, to mentor me. I, I stopped cursing the day I got saved. Who did that? The whole, and I realized all of these things. How to, how to treat a woman, um, how to be respectful to people, um, how to say yes, sir, and yes, ma'am, without regretting it. Because when the Navy, I hated saying yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I, it was, every time it came out of my mouth, I was like, Ugh, you know. Mm -hmm. I didn't through, want to say. gritted teeth. Yes, I didn't want, I didn't respect. Right. God, the Holy Spirit taught me all those things. Even now, you know, I mean, I solved every problem I had mm -hmm. with these. Mm-hmm. That's all I would do is fight. Right. Fight. I was almost thrown through a McDonald's window by a Marine in 19... <laughs> Keep laughing. 
He wasn't an Air Force yeah. guy. <laughs> we might have to edit that out. <laughs> I'm gonna get in trouble. You gonna get in trouble? Let me throw it off on the Air Force guy. <laughs> At least he was a Marine. Literally, the guy picked me up and threw me ten feet across. Oh, at nighttime, outside of a bar, and I almost went through a McDonald's window. I, I didn't care how big, how small. It just, I just fought. I just, and I wasn't great at it, you know. <laughs> but, Took your lumps and kept on moving. Yeah, I was one of those dumb guys. You know, <laughs> it was okay. It was okay rustling and right. fighting, and tussling. That's what I would do. I was Jacob at that point. You know, just right. wrestle. I wanted right. my way. Right. So you had this. Uh, you had the statement you made at Christmas, you started to sold your child, your brother-in-law helped you get everything set up. You're three years in, he kind of uh, says, okay, I'm turning this, this over to you. Uh, we haven't really talked a lot about this older child yet as far as specifically what you do. I mean, we've, we've hit on it, but I want to give you just a chance to, to talk about it specifically about what you do in some, some detail, uh, just so people know, because I'm sure a lot of our people may not be familiar with a soldier's child. And then I got some specific questions about that that I want to ask you, but just give us, you know, give us three or four minutes on, I know if you can fit it all in, because you do a lot. But right. what is a soldier's child? You, you serve the children of the fallen. How do you do that? Right. So, all right, so I'll give you the whole elevator. Okay. So that's exactly what we do. We serve uh, <clears throat> boys and girls who lost a mom and dad in the military. Mm -hmm. um, so it's any active duty death. So it could be combat. It could be a training accident. It could be a sailor blown off the ship at sea. It could be cancer, a stroke. Uh, mm -hmm. A guy, this is a true story, come home on leave in, in a motorcycle accident. It could be PTSD, suicide. It could be post-service so they're out of their service, but it was a service-related injury or illness that leads to death. Mm -hmm. We've had a number of men and women um, die of the sustained injuries. Right. It may be three years, seven years, eight surgeries later. Right. Um, as we all know, suicide is epidemic in the veteran community. Mm -hmm. um, so we, what are we about? We are about the child left behind. We are about James one twenty seven, caring for the widows and orphans mm -hmm. in their distress. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Guess what? I get to do it as a patriot. Mm -hmm. I get to do it for the children. We get to do it for the children of our fallen. So the 1% that defend, that defends the 99. Mm -hmm. I love this, man. I'm going to share it. You know where I'm going with this, right? Oh, and yeah. He leaves the 99. Mm -hmm to go after the 1% of our population signed that contract that says they're willing to defend the freedoms that the 99 get to live out. Mm -hmm. God has so chosen a Soldier's Child Foundation to represent him in going after that 1% of, of the children and the widows left behind. Mm -hmm. And he's doing it through a Soldier's Child Foundation with the gospel message. Right. And so here's the deal. So we started just, I'm mean, just celebrating a child's birthday. Mm -hmm. That's, so what did we start with? Just love and honor. Mm -hmm. It was just love and honor. Love mm -hmm. the child, honor the fallen. Mm -hmm. We say love, honor, and hope. You've heard it before. Oh, yeah. Love the child, mm -hmm. honor the fallen, and then give the children a hope to live out a courageous life. That's where Jesus is. Mm -hmm. That's right there. Right. That's where Jesus is. He's packaged in the hope in, of our message. Sure. So, I no, I didn't get, I wasn't called to start a Christian nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Ministry. I didn't mm -hmm. even know what ministry was. You know, right, I, I right. really, I didn't. You know, it wasn't until a couple of years later, but someone said, "Man, I love the ministry you're doing." I'm like, "Oh yeah, it's a ministry." <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you the truth, man. Yeah. Remember, I'm a passion guy. I'm not That's the right. intellect. That's right. <laughs> uh, should have been a marine. Why did you go in the navy? Uh, okay, so you you obviously you celebrate birthdays. Yeah. That's your core function. But you do a whole lot more than right. that. Uh, you do a lot of camps and things like that. Yeah. Just hit the highlights on that, and then I want to ask you a, a couple of questions. So it was, it was 08, 08, first one. By the end of 2010, we're serving like 80 kids. Mm -hmm. So we've got, we found out another child who celebrated his birthday. Another child, another child, another child. And before you know it, we're in like 10 states. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's 2013. We're serving 400 children. We started two camps, a journey camp, which is a week-long camp. We still do it. This is our 13th year doing it. Um, we started a second journey camp in Texas now. 
Uh, we're doing, going to do 50 there, and we'll do about 150 here. In, actually, it'll be in Kentucky at Barefoot Republic uh, Christian Camp. Um, we do about 250 birthdays, over 250 birthdays, every single month of the year. Mm. So we're, we're doing birthdays. We have under, just under 5,000 ch uh, children and young adults within our database. Mm -hmm. But we do about 33, 3,400 birthdays. That's kind of, we've kind of leveled off. Mm -hmm. So as kids age out, because we do birthdays from 1 to 18, we spend mm -hmm. about $150 per child per birthday. We spend $35,000 a month on birthday gifts, mm -hmm. celebrating the children's lives in honor and love of their fallen parent, mm -hmm. someone that, that, that has died for our country. Right. And so it's, it's, it's really cool, too, because we don't make a distinction in the death. You know, we, we characterize it as they signed the contract and mm -hmm. they were willing. Right. How they died is not important. What is important is you and that we build you up, right. the child. Right. That's what we communicate. When they first, that first birthday, so let's say their mama signs them up when they're nine years old. Two, three weeks before that first birthday that they never heard of a Soldier's Child Foundation before, mm -hmm. they get a big box mm -hmm. of gifts for their birthday based upon their wish list that their mom and maybe the child filled out once they signed up mm -hmm. within our database. Mm -hmm. Then they get a scroll instead of a birthday card and they get... All this pomp and circumstance, everything's wrapped in purple. Mm -hmm. We got bow, uh, gold bows and silver ribbon, and there's messages of love around the box. And, before, and it also tells the child, don't open up until the day of your birthday. Right. Because we're watching. Right. Because that's creepy. We don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but we do say, don't open it up until your birthday. That's right. Some of them do, and the moms tell on them too. It's really funny. <laughs> uh, so imagine. But the whole point is to honor the parents. Yeah. To let the kids know that it did matter and that yeah. somebody does care. Yes, sir. Right? Yeah. And that's and, and you're making that point once a year at their birthday and then mm -hmm. through the other camps that they have opportunity. Those are signed up. They can they can come. Right. Uh, you know, not every child that signs up for birthdays comes to a camp, but no. Uh, but many because camps are from yeah. nine to sixteen years of age. So mm -hmm. so the box is literally this. Mm -hmm. It's the knock. Sure. It's the first step into their lives. Right. The, that first birthday mm -hmm. box on their doorstep right. of their house is actually on the doorstep of their heart. Sure. Because then we, we now do 20 camps a year. We mm -hmm. do everything from horse camp, dance camp, theater camp, Jack and Jill camp. We do a uh, songwriting camp. Uh, we hunt deer. We hunt turkey. We hunt squirrel, rabbit. I mean, all of it. We do right. it all. Right. We, we do have a, a, we do lean towards hunting because that's kind of a natural bend for a lot of the kids because it's what, their fathers did mm -hmm. in most cases. Mm -hmm. And I've been fortunate enough to come you have. come to your hunting camps and, and actually participate and, and serve as a mentor and a guide, which is fun. And I uh, unfortunately haven't been able to do it the last few years, but yeah. I am going to get back to that. Uh, <laughs> yes, you are. I'm going to get back to doing that. Keep praying about it, brother. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I want to ask a question about that because when, when you do a camp, yes, sir. Uh, of course, you know we've heard your story. We know God's important in what you do that he is the one who's driving and fueling your passion. Uh, that's not always front and center in yeah. a soldier's child, right? Yeah. And, uh, but there are intentional moments Absolutely. at a camp or at other places. So talk a little bit, if you would, about yeah. you know, uh, why God should or should not be front and center and, and kind of how you weave the spiritual stuff into what you do. Well, he is front and center. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you see every staff meeting, every board meeting, Jesus Christ, we are Christ-centered. Mm -hmm. We are a Christ-centered ministry. There's mm -hmm. no doubt. What the general public gets out of it, maybe not. I mean, you can find that on our mm -hmm. website. But it's not... Here's what... I didn't have that drive that I was supposed to build it that way. Mm -hmm. So I, I went after the way I felt God was leading me to build it. And I think... And it's kind of our heart that we are so... We are intentional... But we're, we invite, and how do we invite people of all differences to, to be a part of this? Mm -hmm. And there's so much that separates us now mm -hmm. in our country, which stinks, but we do it through love, man. It's, I'm telling you, that is the drive for us. Love conquers all. Well, you can't go, I mean, I've been to the camps. Yeah. 
kid cannot come to the camp without knowing that they're loved. That's right? exactly what how we right. need. And so, you know, I think the reason I ask that question is, you know, I think it's a, a good thing mm-hmm. from the standpoint of, like you said, there's many, there's a diversity of people that are in this circumstance. If you're leading with that, you yeah. don't get that connection. Right. right. And then if you don't get the connection, you don't get the opportunity. Yeah. On the backside, trust me. People find out. They know. They right. know. They know who's front and center. It doesn't right. take long. Right. Um, so, at, like at our camps. So he, let me use what God showed me. The dartboard. Mm-hmm. He showed me I was scoring points in the beginning. That's. I I really didn't have this whole ministry thing in my mind. Mm-hmm. I didn't. Mm-hmm. It started out just answering my neighbors' two questions. Did it matter? Does anyone care? That's. That well, was the I mean, here, but here's the thing with ministry. Yeah. I think part of the trouble is with ministry is we want to put a label on ministry. Yeah. Right. And we want to segregate it out and say, this is ministry and that's not ministry. What we're, what, what we're trying to do, you yeah. know, from a, from, you know, our ministry yeah. uh, is to get people to break those barriers down. Right. And to recognize that whether or not they are giving a birthday present to a neighbor mm-hmm. or whether they're you know, cutting somebody's grass because they're out of town. I mean, whatever they're doing to serve somebody else yeah. and to build those relationships, that can be a spiritual ministry. Yeah. You know, you don't have to have a Bible in your hand or be quoting Bible verses yeah. to be doing ministry, right? And, I, and that's what I want people to see is that it's how we live out our life every day is what God is, is looking for us for. You know, it's mm-hmm. how do we treat other people? Are we showing them that love? Mm-hmm. And we may not call it ministry, but if we're serving other people, that is that is ministry. Yeah, I, and I believe as you're called to those things, or they you step into them, however it happens. Mm-hmm. I I feel so. Here's what happened: I came home from a camp one time, and I told my wife that I had this conversation with a young man, and it kind of went something like this: You can't use the death of your father as an excuse to just go off. You, you know you. You're going to just chase women. You're going to do drugs. You can do all the things you know you're not supposed to. But if your father was here, you tell me yourself that you would be following God. But you're not. Mm-hmm. You're just chasing all this stuff. And I said, you're without excuse. It's the Holy Spirit that will teach you. The Holy Spirit will be your father. And I started, and when I told you the Holy Spirit is the one who taught mm-hmm. that was the first time I said it in my life. And that was only five years ago. Mm. And I came home and I told my wife this whole story. It was a little emotional. And she, we're, we're just laying together. And she, uh, she says to me, well, sweetie, sweetie, don't you know? That's, that's God ministering to the boy in you. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Back up. Right, I was like, that's right. too deep. <laughs> and in fact, it's the truth. And I'm mm-hmm. telling you, I do believe this. About when God calls you to something... He's dealing with you as well, first of all. Mm. He's dealing with something that's in you mm-hmm. that he's using. Mm-hmm. Whatever it is. If it's the soup kitchen, I don't know why, but it's, it, there's a reason why you're being called to it. If it's to start this ministry, to start this benefit, to help these people out, to, to begin this or that, it's go after it. Stay the course. If, if you're in a dry season, I would say to people, if you're in a dry season, there's a reason for that. Mm-hmm. There's a reason for it. Right. Stay the course. Don't give up on God. He doesn't give up on us. He is enough. Jesus Christ is enough. Wait, God's timing. This is, I've heard people say it all my life. Didn't believe it. Mm-hmm. God's timing is perfect. And the things that happen, he tells us to praise him in good and bad. Mm-hmm. It's true. <laughs> it's true. We are to praise him in the bad stuff. Yeah. I've seen things the last two years some stuff have happened to my family man you would say if I told you my son's almost died twice twice mm-hmm. I mean that's what that's not we don't it's difficult to praise God in the middle of those circumstances to ask me right now if I would take either one of those moments back and I'm telling you no mm-hmm. no as much pain as it was in those moments I know I know that God was all over it. He protected my son. And I don't have the answers of why people lose children. My friend just lost his son last week, who was my son's best friend growing up. He just got hit by a drunk driver. He was running. 
He was an athlete. He's been on national news. Mm. And I don't know why some lives are cut short. I don't know why. I don't have any answers for all that. But he's still in that. I'm mm -hmm. telling you. He's still in it for my friend. God is in everything. I promise. We just, through our pain and suffering, if we give it to him, if we give it over to him, he, he covers it. He fills it. His spirit is real. His spirit is real. And I don't think we're, we're never going to be able to explain that. No, right? I mean, no. it, it, doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how smart we are or how many times we see it or how many times it's real. good things come out of bad things. All we can do is, is trust God in those times. We're not going to be able to explain it. One day when we get to see Jesus, yeah. he can explain it to us all then. Of it. But all until of it. then, uh, we're not going to fully understand no. it. We just have to keep trusting in the midst of it that he is going to bring some good out of what to us is a tragic my, situation. My prayer for my friend is that he will say that one day. Mm -hmm. And that will be God, the faithfulness of God in his life. Mm -hmm. It may take him a while. Mm -hmm. But that's my prayer for Dustin. Well, in, in, and, his, in, and his whole family. Well, you deal with you deal with these situations all the time. All the time. I mean, you are all the time. You are engaged with families who have lost a loved one, and we don't prepare and, for it. We well, don't, and, and as now, a people, you know, I mean, when you're a soldier, you know, the soldiers that come home always are wondering, "Why did I come home and yeah. the guy that was right next to me didn't come home?" Yeah. It doesn't make any sense logically, right? right? Uh, how do you deal with the people that, I mean, you deal with a lot of hurting people. How do you deal with them? What do you, what do you it's, tell them? It's, it, it's been, well, I, there's two aspects. So it's the veteran aspect of it, which mm -hmm. is called survivor guilt. We have so many veterans that, so that's a second part of our ministry is our mentorship. I mean, to put on a camp where you got 40 kids hunting deer, I got 60 mentors. Right. <laughs> got more <laughs> men and women mentoring these kids. Right. And it's all volunteer. We put them through our training. We, we get them, uh, they go through our application process and background check and all this. And I mean, they, they, get, they have to be recommended. It's just, it's been amazing. But it's the second part of what we do. Imagine you got a guy. I mean, this just happened last camp. I am not kidding you. Mm -hmm. I, we have a veteran that served with one of our fallen. And he took the two boys hunting turkey for two days mm. during our trip. Mm. Uh, we had 21, 23 kids hunting turkey. Uh, and, and on that camp, we had uh, 34 mentors. It's nuts. Right. I mean, where do all these people come from? So, but that's the second part. It's like we're filling a void in our country, giving people the opportunity yep. to act out on their own heart caring for these widows and orphans. It's, right. You're it's not just... So good. It's healing for them yes, to sir. serve as much as it is. Yeah. And that's the way service works in yeah. general, right? Yeah. When we serve other people... You get more. We get more. Why they, don't we get that? I mean... I'm telling you every day, when, I, when they have the opportunity to speak before the kids, mm -hmm. they say it to the kids. I thought I was going to come in here and change your life. You've changed my life. Mm. I, every mentor says that. <laughs> every single one of them. <laughs> because the resiliency of these kids... And when these kids, some of these kids come in and they're messed up. Mm -hmm. They're coming in with Ziploc bags full of meds for depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts. I mean, they're coming in. We're, mm -hmm. we're acting like a clinic, mm -hmm. a spiritual clinic. Mm -hmm. That's what we are. Right, sure. I'm good with it mm -hmm. because I know who's leading. Right. And it's not me. Right. And, and the changes that we see. You know, I had a mom one time call me and she's like, um, I want to just talk to you about uh, Journey Camp, which is a week-long camp. Mm -hmm. Over 100, you know, this year we'll have 150 kids there. And uh, I just want to talk to you about my son and what happened to him at camp. Well, I take a heart swallow and I'm like, oh gosh, you know. <laughs> Not every single story has been great. There's been some. Sure. But we work, we work, 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 work to fix, you know, where we fell, fall short, obviously. Was humans, um, so I'm like, okay, well, tell me, tell me what happened. She's like, well, um, as I'm talking to you right now, I'm looking out the window, and my son's riding bike with the neighborhood boys. I'm taking good breath. I'm like, hallelujah! Keep riding, kid. <laughs> That's my boy. <laughs> so I said, oh, oh. She said, well, let me explain. I said, okay. She's like, my son doesn't do that. She said, my son doesn't leave his room. 
My son doesn't have friends. He came back. He's, he's, he's not the same. And uh, he's talking, he's asking me questions about his father. He's never asked me questions about his father. Mm. Uh, he's not angry. And I said to her, I said, well, I really believe that what we're doing with, with everything, you know, birthdays, camp, and my leadership program, when we started, we got a scholarship program, and everything we do that, you know, we're, we're loving on your kids, and I believe that we're, we're changing their lives. We're changing the direct trajectory of where they're going. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, point of fact, she said, Daryl, she said, I believe you're doing more than that. She said, I believe you're saving their lives. Mm. And it was in, that was the first time I ever heard anybody say it. And I do believe it now. Mm -hmm. I do believe it. Mm -hmm. And I believe there are lives to be saved within the Soldier's Child Foundation. Mm -hmm. That our kids are at risk. Well, no they're no at doubt. rest. They're at rest. They're at rest. I mean, you you be you're a child of of you grow up. You lose your parent. Boom, put you at risk. Mm -hmm. And your parent commits suicide. Now you're at another risk. In fact, the highest population of children at risk for suicide are children of suicide. Mm -hmm. That's fact. Yeah, just statistics. Yeah. So we have those those. In our clinic, um, those are the things we don't steer away from. We don't shy away. We hit it. We go head on with the kids. That's here's the way. We one, I, one time I, I'll tell you a quick story. Yeah, it's sure. A true yeah. story. Where a child, I was. We used to say um, that we're give back to the children of fallen heroes. We don't used to say that anymore because we're so so adopted children, stepchildren, biological children, any child, uh, any death. Uh, any of that. So suicide is a big one. So they have a stigma on them. The kids do. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying it at a camp. Uh, you know, we're here the day one. It was first night. We're here because we, we believe in you all. We believe in your father, your parents. Um, that that you, know, you are the most important children in our nation. If we're going to give to anybody first, it should be you. The children of our fallen heroes. And as I dropped that, someone said, how the F? Is my father a hero when he shot himself in the head and my mother and I cleaned it up? And it was like across the room. People started, the kids started crying. It was just, it was traumatic. It was, and in that moment, somehow I found the words and I said to him that your father was a warrior. He ran into what most of us would run from. Mm -hmm. Somehow he had that in his DNA. He won battles and lost battles. This one here, he lost. He lost the battle. But it doesn't mean that we're going to, I mean, we're going to be here for you. And for what your father was a part of, I do believe, and not everybody agrees with me on this, I do believe a warrior is a calling. Mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. That's just my belief. I mean, I think it's biblical. It shows them. They were called. I mean, Dave, look at King David. Mm -hmm. What do they say about him? He killed thousands and thousands, more than anybody, but he was a man after God's own heart. Put that together. Mm -hmm. And then the scripture says, Thou shalt not kill. I, can't, I don't have all the answers. I don't, I don't think it's contradictory. I think you just have to understand the whole picture. Sure. That's my belief. Sure. So anyway, that's what, that's where we, that's what we say to the child, um, any child, because it doesn't have to be just a child of suicide. They are at risk. And this is not the answer. Bowing out is not the answer. We got to find hope. That's that's the answer. Find hope. And what is our hope? That our hope is in Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's where we put it. We believe it. We believe He is the answer to man's condition. And we present him. We say to the children, You have lost your earthly father. Let us turn you to your heavenly father. Look what he's done for us. Mm. He's provided his son to be the bridge for us to come back right. to get it right. Right. That's what we do. Right. Well said. Um uh, What I want people to get from this, from everything you're saying, is I'm, I'm sitting here listening and just, just processing what <laughs> you're saying. Many, many people are just hesitant to get involved. You know, you've got a specific mission, and we're going to tell people in a minute how they can get involved with that. But, you know, oftentimes God puts people in front of us that need help, you yeah. know, that won't come out of their room, uh, that have had a traumatic event in their life. 
And I think sometimes yeah. we're hesitant to get involved with them because we're afraid we don't know what to say or whatever. Yeah. But if surely we can find a way to show those people some love, right? To just an ex- extend a hand. That's a big part. I, of it. I think that's what God's really calling us to do. And I and I really this yeah. is this is what I really believe, Daryl. If we as Christians would start doing that, mm-hmm. right? We would change the view of what Christianity is in the in the United States and really even uh, around the world. the world because we have a people have a view of Christianity of being religious and yeah. following these rules yeah. and all this kind of stuff if if Christians would just start living Love. out their faith yeah. and loving their neighbor mm-hmm. right and and not being scared to get involved in those situations that are a little sticky right yeah. I think it could change the world and that, I mean that's that's what you have done well, love, love is the answer. Love is the key ingredient. It's the first ingredient. It's the most important one. And I think why, why we sometimes, even as believers, mm-hmm. you, have, you have an issue with love. Mm-hmm. You know, Are you able to love your neighbor? Or is there bitterness or anger? That's, that's usually why you're not loving. Mm. It's being replaced with garbage that we are holding on to. Mm. I know it. It's, got, it, it's what it is. And I, that's why I keep using the word surrender. Surrender those things of pain, trauma, of bias, of, you know, what race, whatever it is, whatever is holding you down. It's, it's just, it's not allowing you to be who you're supposed to be as a believer in Jesus Christ, as a follower. If you, if you say Jesus is mine and say me, say you, say you, say me. If, that, if, you, if you're that connected, to, if that's what he says we are, mm-hmm. You know, it's his love for me, in me, that comes out of me. Right. That's all I got. I know what I was before Jesus. I know what I am without Jesus. Mm. I am nothing. I am trash. Mm. I know it. I did everything I could to destroy my own life. I had no hope. God, Christ in me. Christ in me. And it's no different than any other person that says... I am a Christian. Mm-hmm. That's the responsibility each and every single one of us have to live for Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, well said again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm feeling it. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, we've been going for a little while. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, obviously, some people are just hearing about a soldier's child. Maybe some people are, are learning more about it. But yeah. if people want to get involved, what, what's the best way to do that? Um, give me a call. <laughs> 615-220-1600. That's our office number. My email is Daryl, D-A-R-Y-L, at a soldierschild.org. Our website is uh, a soldierschild.org. Facebook page, you can see some really great uh, videos and just, I mean, there's a post up there every other day of everything we're doing. You'd, you'd be like, how does this organization exist with four, people, four staff? Mm-hmm. Four staff. Eighty-six percent of every dollar we spend goes to the kids and programs and service. We are good stewards of the money that comes to us, mm-hmm. and uh, God just keeps growing us in that way. But uh, Facebook uh, slash the Soldier's Child, Twitter, all those social medias, we're on all of them. Um, and there, if, if there is a family that is in the situation where they've lost, we have a, never a, said a, no. A service member never said no. They go to the website to sign up. Is that how they get? So ready we have for your on our website. It's kind of donor focused. Mm-hmm. And then it's also family focused. So there's mm-hmm. two different, and that's our missions. Mm-hmm. We have a mission to educate our country, uh, the families left behind, and give you the opportunity to empower, empower, engage you in giving, whether time, talent, or treasure. And then the sick, the most important mission is caring for the children and the widows of our all fallen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what a soldier's job. We do it through birthdays, all the way from one to eighteen. We do run twenty different camps a year. We have over five hundred kids coming to camp every year. Uh, we have a leadership program called PS23, uh, where they go on these outback excursions. Um, we call it off the grid. Uh, they can become a mentor, so they come back at 20, 22 years old, and they're coming to the camp, horse camp, uh, where we have 10 year olds and 12 year olds, and they're mentoring the child through empathy. Right. They've been, been where they're there. At. Yeah. yeah been so there. Who's better than that? Then the next phase of PS23 is what begins tomorrow at Narrow Gate in Williamsport, Tennessee. We are starting our discipleship program for 16, 19 through 24-year-olds. 
that will come, spend five days, and they will go through our discipleship program. They are the ones that come to our journey camp. Only they could come. You have to go through our discipleship program to come to journey camp. Mm -hmm. Journey camp is the one camp, our flagship camp, where we focus on the gospel message. For six days, they zip line, they do uh, fishing, paintball, uh, water sports, horseback riding, all this, uh, BMX, all that. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus, Jesus, Jesus intermingled through all of it. And then in the end, uh, kids come to Christ and we baptize them. And we use our PS23 disciples. So these are kids that have grown up, now young adults, that are leading the young children through empathy mm. and through the power of God in them. Mm. Our Very goal good. is to take them on mission trips and do, we're just going to keep growing, growing, growing that program. And you're serving, forever. serving kids in how many states in the U.S.? Every now? single one. Every single state now. Yes, sir. And so, you Texas know, Texas is our biggest. Wherever you're at in the United States, you can. There's an ASC child there. You can sign up. You can yeah. you can be served, and I'm I'm assuming, of course, you can donate from anywhere. But there's also opportunities. You do a lot of things around the country, so you don't have to be in Tennessee to participate. Right. So if someone's listening to this and you want to bring a soldier's child to your community. We have a, a program called CCAP for corporations. It's Compassionate Corporate America Partners for churches and civic groups. Uh, for churches, we call it Compassionate Christians Achieving Purpose. How cool is that? And then it's James 127. <laughs> Here's the deal. If you look at James 127, it's so funny if you look at that one verse where it's, it's sandwiched. So shut your mouth <laughs> and don't be polluted by the world. Mm -hmm. It's sandwiched with careful widows and orphans. And that's what he says. Mm -hmm. Basically, control your tongue. Watch what you say. Mm -hmm. You're better off keeping your mouth closed. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not it funny. Takes, it takes longer for some of us to learn that lesson. Well, those that, three uh, things are for me. <laughs> Shut your mouth. Uh, care for widows and orphans. And don't be polluted by the world. Because I was. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's me. That's, that's, what I, that's my life right there, James right. 127. So, um, yeah. Mm. Well, Daryl, we appreciate you taking time uh, out of your schedule. I know you got a lot, obviously, going on. I don't, yeah. I don't know how you keep up with it. You got to have some passion driving that energy level somewhere. I, I had a staff meeting this morning. I led the prayer with God. Thank you, thank you, for the stamina, for the drive that you've mm -hmm. given me. Mm -hmm. I'm about to turn sixty, and I know these guys still work. <laughs> you know, you're you still doing those ropes courses and oh, man, getting out just, there chasing. Yeah, I do. I do it all. I, I was in Texas just this past January and they had me on a 400 foot cliff on a piece of wood this big <laughs> and you got to jump <laughs> to a trapeze bar. It's like, there's no way. I'm the last one in line. Some of the kids wouldn't do it because this is our PS23. It was a PS23 off the grid trip. And, uh, but half of them did it. And it was okay. You know, you know we want to face our fears and we want to conquer them. Well, now I'm the last one. And I'm like, I don't want to do this. I honestly <laughs> do not want to climb up this little ramp mm -hmm. and step out on this little ledge and jump onto a trapeze bar, even though these kids are belaying me. And that's what it was. They're, they got, oh, they're mm -hmm. holding the road. You know belay, right? Yeah, yeah. I get up there, and they're all talking. I finally turn around. and like, you guys got to shut up. <laughs> I did. I was like, how am I supposed to focus? <laughs> so first they laughed, and then it was like, no one's talking. Yeah. So I'm like, thank you. I couldn't, I was like this in a crowded position. I couldn't even stand up, Scott. Uh, your knees I, I, were weak. They were locked. <laughs> so I finally get up, and I'm like this, and I'm holding onto this rope, and I'm completely secure. They got me, you know. Sure, yeah. And actually, the guy says to the end, he says, it actually only takes two people to hold the rope. And I had like, 25. <laughs> and so, so they pushed the bars way out there. It's like, you know, eight feet. And so he's got this remote thing. He draws it in. He says, is that good? I was like, no. <laughs> so literally, I could touch the bar. <laughs> so I, I, I did. I jumped about three feet. But it was scary as could be. But that's one of the things. I would have never done anything. I'm afraid of heights. Worse than anybody. <laughs> and I have done more height stuff. I've jumped off telephone poles, zip lines, all this stuff, all because I believe in it. Sure. I believe we are to face our fears. And, you know, one, one guy told me one time, I went rock climbing, and I, I, I told him, bro, I can't do it. I can't do it. 
can't do that. Looking straight up at 80 feet that we're going to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's like, and this is, I'll end with this. He's a great analogy. And uh, he was a believer at my church. And he said, he said, Daryl, he says, look at this stuff. He said, this is God. I'm like, what are you talking about? He said, you see this in carabiner. He said, you have to trust this equipment is going to do its job. You have to trust it. Because mm -hmm. if you don't, you're going to do it with fear. You, mm -hmm. have, to, you have to trust that, that uh, all of these carabiners are going to lock into these posts as you go up, and it's going to keep you secure. And it's, that's, that's how we live our life, that we trust that God is in front. God is alongside you. Mm -hmm. God is behind you. Mm -hmm. And all of what you do, he's in everything. Say you, say me, say me, say you. And that's what I did. I believed them, and I went up the darn yeah, thing. No. <laughs> I didn't come down so gracefully. <laughs> I went up fine. <laughs> well, it is about trusting. Yeah. And trusting is what gets us off the ground and gets us up the mountain. Yes, sir. So, very good. Thank you, Daryl. I do, yes, I do appreciate you coming up. Yes, sir. Great story. Uh, I know it's going to be encouraging people. So, just appreciate you sharing. Soldierschild.org. There we go. There yes, we go. Sir. If y'all have enjoyed the conversation today, give us a five-star rating. And more than that, share it with somebody else that needs to be encouraged or that needs to know about a soldier's child. We appreciate y'all tuning in and just uh, y'all be blessed until we talk again.